The host, Ethiopia. 32 independent African states signatories to a vision of a decolonized and united African continent. Algeria, the latest edition, had just been declared independent from France. Ben Bella had won his struggle, the struggle, the Algerian struggle of France. France had, could, after all the other Francophone countries had got their independence, Algeria was denied that independence by de Gaulle. That's why the Algerians took to arms. And that's why Ben Bella could come. And we sang glory to him. And of course, he regarded that the independence of Algeria was not complete uh, until the independence of all the other countries, including South Africa, was also uh, acquired, until those other countries were also free. And Ben Bella, we still uh, remember, what he said, he put aside his speech. He said, let us die a little for South Africa. Let us die a little for South Africa. It was a call to action from Algeria's Ben Bella. The OAU shouldered the ambitions of millions, including those whose forefathers were chained and ferried across the oceans. Even African-American activist Malcolm X put his faith in the statesmen he described as shepherds of all African people. But Africa's immediate task was the liberation of all colonized countries on the continent. Among them, Rhodesia, under the rule of Britain and Prime Minister Ian Smith. Once upon a time, Prime Minister, you said you would never see black rule in this country in your lifetime. Do you still stand by that? Yes, I believe that uh, that was a fair comment. The African group to the United Nations demanded the Security Council intervenes. The OAU further resolved to put pressure on the United Kingdom by breaking all ties, but not all member states signed the convention. On the ground, Zimbabwean guerrillas became more fragmented. The Organization of African Unity resolved to only recognize Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwe African National Union and Joshua Nkomo's Zimbabwe African People's Union under the banner The Patriotic Front. When you go to war, you go to war knowing that you go to die. But because the cause you're fighting for is more important than your life, then you go ahead. The cause we are engaged in is far bigger than my, my, my life. If I die, Zimbabwe is not dead. Zimbabwe is very much alive. And therefore, we die going forward and Zimbabwe continues to come after us. And Zimbabwe shall continue. The OAU emphasized that it was a moral obligation to fund and provide military assistance to all liberation movements. I remember about 1978-79 moving to Guinea-Conakry, to Senegal, before getting to the OAU, just pleading for assistance, assistance humanitarian, if it could be given us, assistance 
military, or military nature, if you could get it. And we were getting it here and there, here and there. Those who could give. Algeria, training. Egypt of NASA, lots of training. OAU member states managed to force the Rhodesian crisis on the agenda of the United Nations Humanitarian Council in Geneva, and Ian Smith buckled under pressure. I believe we have a very important part. To play. My reports from all over the world indicate that the Rhodesian government delegation have come out of this on a very high level indeed, that our standing amongst the major nations of the world, at any rate of the free world, is a lot higher now than it was before. And on the other hand, the standing of the black delegations there has taken a pretty serious dip because there is no doubt they have behaved themselves in a deplorable manner. To the contrary, on 18 April 1980, the world burst into song and dance. Bob and Bob were on stage. Robert Gabriel Mugabe was the victor of the polls after the Lancaster House Agreement. Oh, I was really uh, overjoyed and uh, I felt uh, overwhelmed by the victory that we had scored. But at the same time, I felt humbled because this is not a victory at a soccer match. It's uh, more than a victory even in the battlefield. It's, it's a, a victory which... Um, confers upon you uh, a tremendous responsibility and the weight of that responsibility is really uh, overwhelming. Uh, I'm humbled by the support that uh, the people have given us. Zimbabwe was independent. Her children were jamming and Stevie Wonder took note. to assure all the people that my government will strive to bring about meaningful change to their lives. His Zimbabwe became a training ground for the ANC's military wing, Mkondowe Sizwe. Unfortunately uh, for them, they would have to go through the same bitter um, path, walk the same bitter path as uh, Rhodesia walked. And it, it, it meant loss of life. It meant the suffering of both black and white, and um, uh, it meant the destruction of uh, infrastructure. The jewel of Africa was beaming. Its economy reached an 11% growth. The budget on health and education tripled. Our economy is sustaining these British citizens. Every day, our services, education, health, and others are sustaining these thousands of people we had regarded ourselves as Zimbabweans, but apparently Britain still regards them as their own charges. If so, then Britain must pay us something to sustain them here. But three years into independence, Africa's beacon of hope sent out distress signals. An estimated 20,000 people died in the Matebele land civil war. Government forces, the 5th Brigade, stand accused. There is still that uh, um, element in Matabel land which has not yet accepted national reconciliation. Fast forward two decades later, 107 people killed during election-related violence. The 2002 elections were rigged, said some observers. We have never rigged election any election at all. A conviction seemingly endorsed by the OAU, including South Africa. But a report compiled by two judges who were commissioned by then-President Thabo Mbeki found the elections were not free and fair. Aid agencies warned of a deteriorating humanitarian crisis and food shortages. Hunger continues to stalk Zimbabwe. Relief aid operations are continuing, but no pledges have yet been made by the donor community as the country runs out of stock. The situation here is growing desperate. 
people and animals often have to compete for the next meal. At the time, the country's first citizen had sanctions imposed on him by the United States of America and the United Kingdom. I think it's very important to emphasize this isn't a black-white issue at all. Um, as I say, the vast majority of countries, black or white or Asian, are in favor of continuing this suspension because we can see that Zimbabwe is so clearly in breach of all the principles the Commonwealth stands for. And it's worth pointing out many of these African countries um, sitting around the table are countries that have freed themselves from various types of dictatorship and have now got functioning democracies. Zimbabwe has not been a, a good case study for democracy in a very important part of the world. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, not only Mr. Mbeki, but other leaders uh, convince uh, the current leadership to promote democracy. My country, Zimbabwe, is the innocent victim of their spiteful sanctions imposed by the United States and other Western powers. The sanctions were preceded by Zimbabwe's controversial land reform policy. What we will not accept is for my government to be called upon to tax the poor peasants so uh, they can buy back their land. It, the land was never bought from our ancestors in the first place. Expropriation without compensation. War veterans championed violent land grabs. Uh, no, I've been told to leave, but I've been seven days. As Zimbabwe's landscape went through a lethal shift, the OAU too was taking on a new identity. The Africa Union was launched in Durban, South Africa. It ushered in a charter on democracy, elections and governance. But even then, no AU resolution on the Zimbabwe crisis which had preoccupied even the United Nations. It will only be in 2008 that Zimbabwe was thrust on the desk of AU member states. By then, shelves had run empty, hyperinflation had struck and the currency in short supply. Zimbabwe was no longer home for millions. Violence swept through the country during the election runoffs in 2008. The facts that we have is a chronology of violence perpetrated by ZANU-PF against MDC members. Some of the results, some of the incidents are actually leading to the loss of life. Two women have been shot up in Mashano Centro, one pregnant, a policeman has been shot. Now we want to know what Mugabe is going to say. I will declare the fight to be, to be on. And it will be a fight to the finish, I can tell you. And they won't win the fight, we will win it. The MDC can never be a government of this country, never, ever. Human Rights Watch called on the AU to reject the election results as illegal means of maintaining power. They wanted the South African president, Thabo Mbeki, replaced for what they called his failed mediation efforts. What we are concerned about is when quiet diplomacy is used as a pretense, as a way not to, to confront uh, abusive government. Instead, the African Union pledged its support for Mbeki, after all, he had brokered an agreement leading to a government of national unity. That is the challenge that we will be facing, uh, especially with those residual elements who want to resist the fact that the people of Zimbabwe have a right to choose their own government. We have now come to the conclusion of the exercise and all parties are agreed. Sure, there will still be some T's to cross, I's to dot, to dot, but uh, we are generally agreed. The African Union further campaigned unsuccessfully for all sanctions against Mugabe to be dropped to ease the economic tension. The incoming U.S. president in 2008, Barack Obama, found the sanctions in place and on his departure in 2017, left them untouched. Sometimes you'll hear a leader say, well, we're, I'm the only person who can hold this nation together. 
If that's true, then that leader has failed to truly build their nation. You look at Nelson Mandela. Madiba, like George Washington, forged a lasting legacy, not only because of what they did in office, but because they were willing to leave office and transfer power peacefully. And just as the African Union has condemned coups and illegitimate transfers of power, the AU's authority and strong voice can also help the people of Africa ensure that their leaders abide by term limits and their constitutions. Nobody should be president for life. Six months later, as Mugabe relinquished his AU chairmanship, the veteran leader hit back. There is Obama today, yes. What is he? What is he? A voice is made to speak their language, to act their act. And not our act, but their act. They are still superiors. The blacks Go to Harlem when you're in New York, you'll shed tears. Today, if there is no education for all, no health for all. Blacks in the streets. And nobody seems to talk about it. But they instead still want to talk about us. What help is coming from them? Regime change. This ignites Malcolm X's 1964 call that the OAU should occupy itself with the plight of all Africans, no matter where they find themselves in the world. A night when thousands of protesters gathered peacefully around the country in solidarity over two black men killed this week at the hands of police. It was just hours earlier when an emotional President Obama delivered an impassioned plea for a rethink of how law enforcement engages with black communities. Has this been a miscarriage of justice by member states? Like some argued, they failed the people of Zimbabwe. However, it's evident there were lone voices in the AU, some more powerful than others, as is the case in politics. Ask Zimbabwe's immediate neighbours in SADC. We have had problems with the conduct of some of the elections in the past mm. about their credibility. Um, but even if they had been free and fair, I think um, my opinion has always been that 10 years uh, at the, at the, uh, leading any kind of organization, not just the country, mm. government, any organization, is pretty much the, the, the maximum someone should be there. Before I think people uh, themselves want to change, and, and, and um, even if you may think you're doing a, a good job, I think it's a good time to usher in. And a country like that, and many other countries, with the millions of people that they have, um, there are plenty of people there who have got good racial qualities who mm. take over that country. Um, but obvious, it's obvious that, you know, at his age that he is now, and the state that Zimbabwe is in, he's not really able to provide the leadership that could get it out of this predicament. See, now we can move very far, you know, Comrade President Mugabe. Because as a sad, we are not shy. Not so. No more about teening out, we don't care. As long as we lead our country. Huh? They say they can change regimes. Regime change. And in Zimbabwe, they have said we will have regime change. I have said never, ever. <laughs> And that is one reason I have stuck on. I want to prevent regime change. It will never come. And it has never come. And he's stuck on. 
but only until November the 21st, 2017. I, Robert Gabriel Mugabe, in terms of section 96, subsection 1 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe, hereby formally tender my resignation as the President of the Republic of Zimbabwe with immediate effect. <laughs> Mugabe's 37-year rule had been overthrown. His hand forced on the dotted line on the resignation letter after firing his deputy Emerson Nagawa. This while there were concerns in ZANU-PF that the First Lady Grace Mugabe was eyeing the highest office in the land. The scenes almost reminiscent of 18 April 1980. November the 21st, 2017, Zimbabwe's second Independence Day, some concluded. We must have a fresh beginning, a new start. Yes, I feel betrayed. Shouldn't have gone that way. Betrayed and the country betrayed. Also, our ideology betrayed. Betrayed, Mugabe believes, by his own comrades and the army he was the commander-in-chief of. I said it was a coup d'etat. Some people have refused to call it a coup d'etat. And what happened? He could never have assumed the presidency of the country without the army. But not according to the assessment of the African Union or the West for that matter, who are now willing to do business with Zimbabwe again. We will never forget these strong ties of history and friendship with that beautiful country accurately described as the jewel of Africa. All Britain has ever wanted for Zimbabweans is to be able to decide their own future in free yeah. and fair elections. Yeah. Mugabe's consuming ambition was always to deny them that choice. And this House will remember the brutal litany of his 37 years in office. The voice of the people is the voice of God. <laughs> Today, we are witnessing the beginning of a new and unfolding democracy. Nature and brought into government, and whose life I had worked so hard in prison to save, as he was threatened with hanging. That one day he would be the man who would turn against me. There was a new sheriff in town, the crocodile that is. Well, this is the moment that many Zimbabweans have been waiting for. For the majority of those who have filled up this stadium, this is the first time that they will be witnessing the inauguration of a different president besides Robert Mugabe. <laughs> And he enjoyed the support of South Africa, a country that has always come to Mugabe's aid. Mnagagwa was accepted by the African Union as Zimbabwe's legitimate leader, despite his predecessor's apprehensions and the alarms sounded by Mugabe's allies. The so-called dispute 
a succession dispute between uh, the Mnangagwa uh, faction, which called itself uh, Lacoste, and, and the so-called G40 that we were uh, associated with. It was a power grab related to a factional fight within ZANU-PF. It had nothing to do with the public interest. It had nothing to do with the national interest. It had nothing to do with the territorial uh, integrity of Zimbabwe. It was uh, uh, an unprecedented in, in our region, in Southern Africa, act by the military to descend down to the level of uh, uh, squabbles within a political party, intervene on behalf of an individual. It marked the end of Mugabe's rule. But would his to-do list be discarded into the bins of history? For over 20 years, many of us have come to this rostrum pleading and demanding the reform of the Security Council. Today we are no closer to achieving that goal than we were 20 years ago. Sahrawi is a debt we owe to the people of Sahrawi. When shall we pay that debt? When shall we? When shall we decide that the people of Sahrawi become independent. Our charter says the colonial boundaries that we found in 1963 shall be the boundaries we respect. We are all free. Let the people of Sahara we also be free. The evolution of time teaches us what seems a huge trauma today will fade into history. I will still be there. I will still be there until until God says until God says come. Then I'll go and join the others. But as long as I'm still alive, I'll still have the punch. Now, reports by Aldrin Sampier looking at the OAU and the AU's relationship with former Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe. We're going to have uh, more headlines for you at the top of the hour, but first, let's catch you up with the weather.
Yes.